we good to go, Ken? Good morning, Hope City. Come on in. I invite you to find a seat. Kudos to all of you who actually got up out of bed and out of the house and are here in person on time. I always think that's a major accomplishment. Yay! Especially if you have children. <laughs> it's so good to be here with you this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 42. Why don't you rise as we read the word of God this morning? Prepare our hearts to come before him. As the deer pants for streams of water, so, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where's your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Up from the ashes, your love has brought us. Out of the darkness and into the light, lifting our sorrows, bearing our burdens, healing our hearts. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing our to our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing Alleluia. Chains have been broken. Oh, God. 
We invite you to uh, turn to the person next to you. And even though uh, some of the restrictions have ended, we invite you to do a elbow bump, say hello, get to know somebody new this morning. Good morning, everyone. Hi, uh, thanks for being with us here again. Yeah, I hope you guys are uh, feeling okay after that little bit of a time change. Um, my name's Andrew, I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to Hope City. If it's your first time, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for being with us this morning. At Hope City Church, we exist to bring the hope of Jesus to greater Vancouver and beyond. And we envision being missional, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, and multiplying. Uh, so I'm here to bring you our community news for the week. Um, our first one is that I do have an announcement that our live stream will be ending um, on Palm Sunday, April 10th. So that's four more Sundays from today. Uh, will be our last one in about a month. Um, so we're just giving you a lot of notice about that. Four more Sundays. Um, the sermon audio recordings will still be made available on our YouTube channel. We're just, we're just going to keep all of our media there. I know it can be kind of a surprise for everybody that we are uh, stopping the live stream, but uh, as you guys know, running the live stream has been a lot of uh, amount, a lot of work, uh, responsibility, and stress to our worship operations team. Um, since we resumed our in-person worship in September, we've had a couple people here every single week since September 12th, so the last six six months, and so we've decided, you know, for for them, and also just. Uh, as things continue to open up, uh, we are going to be stopping our live stream. So um, Sunday, April 10th. So just giving you guys a big, big heads up. Again, the audio recordings of the sermon will still be made available on our YouTube channel. This is what we did uh, before we had live stream. We would put our audio sermons online. Um, so we'll continue to remind you guys of that. Um, but we are inviting everyone to mark Easter weekend with us in person. Uh, we're going to be doing the Stations of the Cross on Good Friday, the morning of Good Friday, April 15th, and celebrating Easter together in person on Sunday, April 17th. So more details to come on that, but uh, we invite you to join us in person for Easter weekend, all right? So we'll be announcing that in weeks to come. I know it's going to take an adjustment, but um, it's just something that we have to do. And I just actually want to say a very big thank you right now to our worship operations team, to the team that's been serving every week. Yes. <clears throat> thank you. Just for managing all the hiccups every week. Thank you very much. Uh, I do, we do have a, an update for the youth. So I'm going to call Michelle up, um, our pastor of Children and Family Ministries. And while she's doing that, we're just going to talk uh, about a little bit about um, a need that we have that's been brought up to us. We announced this last week. Uh, we do need accommodation, or there's a family that will be joining VCS, hopefully after spring break, looking for accommodation, um, rental accommodations for a mother and two teens in the Vancouver, Burnaby, or New West area. Uh, they're in need of low-cost, long-term housing uh, possibilities so that they can live closer to VCS. Uh, right now, they're outside of these areas, um, living quite far away, so you can imagine the commute to school every day, every day will be very difficult. So Vancouver, Burnaby, or New West area, if you guys know of any opportunities there for uh, long-term housing, um, you can talk to Grace Vu about that. And they also do need a laptop for one of the teens um, who's in uh, grade, I think grade 10 um, or grade 11, and two sets of uniforms. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you can help with school supplies as well um, that they might need. So this is a refugee family um, the kids have just come in December, and they're preparing to start school right after spring break. So this is an opportunity that has come to us. Um, yeah, we can help right away. So if you guys are able to help, you can contact Grace and uh, find out more information there. Yeah. So on that note, uh, uh, one way or tangible way that we can um, show our love and care to these this family that's coming is putting together um, two backpacks for the grade 10 boy who's called um, Ramen and then the grade 7 girl who's called Honiko. Um, we want to encourage um, the youth especially, but also anyone in Hope City if you would like to um, 
help put together some materials. Um, just bring an item and then we'll be collecting it next week. I'll be posting the, um, the list of things we will need. So if you would like to bring that item, just put your name down there so that way we don't get multiples of the same thing. Uh, that will be posted on the Hub today. So we'll be putting a list of materials that each um, student may need. And um, next Sunday, we're actually having um, the grade nines and up having a pizza party at Grace and Phil's um, patio. So the youth who are going, you can just bring it there if you like. Or we're going to be collecting at um, church as well if you're not going as well. We'll be putting together um, tips for grade 10 and tips for grade 7 as a little welcome note in their backpack as well to encourage them as they start a new um, school in Vancouver Christian. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, I also just want to uh, quickly mention, uh, we know that the mask mandate has changed for our province, and we will be making an announcement about that next week. I uh, just, you know, it only happened on Friday, so our leadership's working on a statement or an announcement about that. Um, but yeah, so stay tuned for that. We will communicate with you. Uh, it's just. Yeah, it just happened, so we are working on that, just letting you know. Um, later on in our worship, uh, we will be having a time of offering where we can give back to God a part of what he's given to us um, in terms of our finances um, to help further his kingdom. If you're new with Hope City, uh, please don't feel obligated to give, and uh, the best way to give if you would like to give is through e-transfer. And we love to stay connected with you if you're new or if you just want to know more about Jesus or you want to talk to one of our pastors or you have any concerns or prayer requests, you can go to our website, hopecitychurch.org, and click Let's Stay Connected and fill out that form and someone will be on, in contact with you. And we're going to continue our practice of praying for those who are teaching and preaching. Um, so can I get a volunteer to pray for Catherine, who's going to be teaching our preschool? Thank you very much. And Michelle as well, thank you. And Ethan, thank you very much. And we have Wenny, thank you. And we also have Jonas. And we also have Phil, who's going to be preaching down here. Thank you very much. All right, so again, this is just silent prayer, praying for people actively while they're uh, preaching and teaching. And... Um, yeah, we're going to uh, continue before the kids and youth go upstairs uh, in a time of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Lord God, we just thank you for um, Sunday, uh, this day where we can come together and worship you. Um, this time we've set aside to come and glorify you and, and just magnify you and to focus on you, God. Um, may we just be able to center ourselves and hear from you, uh, meet with you, and may your spirit just surround this place, um, surround this school and this room. Um, God, we continue to lift up to you um, the nation of Ukraine. Um, we ask, God, that you would just redeem this situation and, and draw people to you, God. Um, may Ukrainians and Russians um, discover who you are and find um, peace and safety and comfort and, and truth and freedom in you, God. And we pray um, just for the government leaders, all that are involved around the world, uh, for wisdom, for, for good decisions that will help the people of Ukraine, um, that will uh, create peace in our world. And God, would you just deliver um, Ukraine from, from the e evil that may be happening over there, the things that we can't see, the things we may be hearing about, God. Um, have mercy and um, heal this land, heal this nation, God. Um, give them peace um, to be able to um, just develop their nation, to, to rebuild and to not have this war continue, God. And we pray for the conflict um, just between Ukraine and Russia um, that may create conflict within families living on opposite sides of the border um, because they're so closely related. And for those nations that are helping uh, those that have left, um, those who are now refugees, who are displaced, who have left their homes and don't have a home, God, we pray for um, you to provide uh, those basic needs and more. And we ask that you would be with the families of those soldiers who have, um, who are fighting um, and give them peace and give them safety and comfort, God. And we pray for the church in Ukraine and in Russia as well, that they can be a light, that they can speak out and um, help the people in need. 
And God, we also lift up to you um, Hong Kong and just um, the COVID situation there. We pray for uh, the full hospitals and all the healthcare workers, um, just the strain that it's putting on the healthcare system. We pray for the residents of Hong Kong um, and just all those who are, who are sick, um, who are suffering, who are struggling. And we pray for their families as well. Lord, we lift up to you all that is happening in your world because you know what is happening. And um, we pray for, for your mercy, for your um, intervention, God. And we intercede for these people. Lord, we thank you um, for this time that we have here. We thank you for uh, spring break. Uh, I pray that you would be with our families, that you would bless them as they um, have time together, um, whether they're here or going away, God, would you um, bless them and be with them. And we thank you for this break that the students have and our teachers. And we just thank you for our community of families and, and kids and youth. And Lord, we pray for those that are, um, that may be mourning right now, um, if they know people or if they have loved ones who have passed, God, uh, we pray for your peace, for your comfort, for your presence, um, just a reminder of your goodness and that you are here for them. We pray for these um, families that have been affected um, of loved ones passing recently, God. Lord, we lift up to you all the other things um, that we may be experiencing, and we thank you that we can just come to you together um, as one body and, and come to you in, in our quiet time as well, because you are our refuge, you are our rock, and you comfort us, and we seek you, God, and we seek your kingdom. We pray for our kids and our youth, for those who are teaching and preaching as well. Um, God, would you just be with them this morning? In your name we pray, amen. I'd love to share with you two verses that I find particularly uplifting. And at times when we feel like we're surrounded by brokenness, and perhaps we are living in moments of sadness, living in moments of grief, Psalm 145, verses 13 and 14 remind us the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. And I think this is a good, a good verses for us to cling to. So I invite you to stand as we continue in worship this morning. you'll say you'll do you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus our hope is in you alone our strength in your mighty
shortest verses in the Bible we're going to be looking at today briefly is Jesus wept. And a commentary that I was reading in a, a book recently said, why did Jesus weep? He knew that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why, why was he weeping? And, and the author said, he's weeping because of sin. Because he was exper experiencing firsthand how sin and the brokenness of sin affects us and causes us grief and sorrow and destruction. And Jesus stood outside Lazarus' tomb and it was his way of, of coming alongside us and talking about, this is wrong. His heart was breaking because he knew that this is not the way that God created the world to be. And so I think sometimes when we weep, we need, to, we need to ask ourselves, what are we weeping for? Are we weeping for the right things? Are we weeping for the things that breaks God's heart? And so we're going to sing a version of the prayer, Our Father, and cry out to God to bring his kingdom come. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly, your will be done the same on earth.
Good morning. Uh, please feel free to take a seat. What an appropriate song or prayer to pray. Uh, when we see the brokenness, we see the violence, we see uh, just the devastation that is happening in our world, uh, especially as we think of the Ukraine um, or Ukraine, like, Lord, would you bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? Uh, this is the second Sunday of Lent, and we are going to continue our journey as we reflect on our mortality, as we reflect on our brokenness, as we reflect on our sinfulness, and we're doing this all in light of the salvation and the hope that we have in Jesus. And so we're going to continue our series, Memento Mori, uh, which simply means in Latin, remember that you will die. And so in the next couple of weeks, um, today we're talking about grief. The next week, we're going to talk about sickness. Then we're going to talk about suffering, seasons of pain. And then we're going to extend that. We're going to talk about what it means to be afflicted. We're talking about prolonged anguish, chronic pain, situations that we can't escape from, where there's no simple remedy. And then we're going to continue, and we're going to talk about dying. This is something that we, we normally institutionalize. Um, we usually keep death to, towards the hospitals or the hospices you know, out of our homes, out of the things that we interact with, unless we're seeing it on a screen. We're, we're going to get up close and personal with this. And I think we need to, because if we're going to seriously celebrate the victory and the joy that is Easter, we need to go there. And so that's where we're going. We're going to talk about grief as a church today. And um, just as an aside, I just want to take a moment. I know that Andrew has already announced that we are winding down our, our live stream uh, ministry. Uh, I want to say thank you, Ken. You're already working right now. Uh, you're always working. Um, my goodness. And he does this as a volunteer. And in fact, um, I got to know him a lot more um, during the pandemic because uh, I was making... Um, video sermons from home, um, probably not of a great quality. And so uh, our, our resident videographer and photographer said, hey, can I come and help? And he literally came for a solid year every Thursday. You know, Thursday afternoon would be my, t t my time to kind of hang out with Ken and connect with him. And he'd be on the other side of the camera. And it felt so much better in my garage, not just preaching to a camera, but actually there's, there's one human being on the other side, and it made all the difference. So Ken, thank you so much. I wanna share with you a personal story um, of how that has impacted me. Um, some of you know my grandma passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, the last six months, seven months, she moved in with us as her health was declining. And um, I would come home from our services here in person, and we were live streaming at that time. And every day that I would get home, uh, she would go and grab my hand, and she'd say, hey, I saw you preach today. You know, I, I saw you preach today. And it wasn't probably, you know, she'd do this every single week, every single Sunday. Hey, I saw you. I saw you. Um, and then um, just a couple weeks ago, she actually said, hey, you did such a great job, and which made me laugh because English is not her first language. Actually, I don't think she'd understand 95% of what I'm saying. So I was like, Grandma, what did you understand? And she was like, well, you were just waving your hands in a way that I really enjoyed watching, <laughs> you know. And when my grandma passed, I had this moment where I talked with Grace. I shared with her that my journey with her has not been easy, but it's been so beautiful, especially towards the end. I remember as a, as a young man when I told her that I wanted to pursue pastoral ministry, and this was not something she wanted to brag to the other grandmas about. You know, she had other grandkids that were, you know, uh, great professions, you know, professions that earn a lot. And, and that made her incredibly proud. And here I was saying, sorry, Grandma, I don't think I'm going to pursue dentistry. I think I'm going to go into pastoral ministry. And I remember, like, even on the phone when she was in Toronto, I could hear the disappointment come across that telephone line. Um, but I persisted. You know, this is God's calling. I persisted. I remember telling her that I was going to go plant a church. And she said, that's kind of like taking um, a demotion, isn't it? Like you're going from something where it's salaried and now you're going to have to fundraise, right? 
But she ended up becoming like a huge supporter financially and also through prayer. And as I reflected on just the opportunity, Kin, that the live stream provided in terms of her interacting with me, it wasn't so much now that as a 40-year-old man, I sought her approval. I knew I had that, but she was just showing me love. She just wanted to let me know towards the end of her life that she loved me, and that, that's everything. And so I know I'm kind of sad that we're winding this down, um, but I just wanted to say thank you, especially to everyone who's been part of the media ministry, uh, the live stream ministry. Um, it's made a big impact in my life. Um, and I'm hoping that as we continue to open up as a church, we can continue to meet together in person. We can rebuild some of these relationships. That's all I wanted to say about that. I know I have a sermon. I know I have to be aware of time. Uh, we're talking about grief today. We're talking about what it means to learn to weep. Uh, we're talking about what it means to deal honestly with our disappointments and our losses, both individually and also collectively as a church. We're talking about what it means to be fully human as God has made us, and, and also to be a church who grieves with those who grieve, mourns with those who mourn, not just rejoices. And I feel like the church knows how to celebrate, but sometimes as a church, we really don't know how to mourn with those who mourn. We, we don't know how to fully engage with some of the brokenness that we see in our world. We offer our thoughts and prayers, uh, but we don't really go beyond that. And so I think we have a lot to learn as a church. We, we have an opportunity to allow grief to shape us, to be compassionate and yet joyful people. And I wonder what it would be like to hold that intention in, in, in a mature way. And so I want to talk about grief today. But as you and I know, grief is a part of our everyday experience of simply being human. I want to look at Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, and, and how it talks about life, and how it talks about grief, and how it talks about celebration, and, and also difficulty, and also mourning. And this is how it reads. It says, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. That's kind of pandemic, COVID, social distancing. I think that's what it's kind of referring to, and maybe more. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. And a time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You see, when the teacher says that there is a time for everything, he is not talking about options. He is not saying that life is like ordering from a menu a la carte, where you pick and choose the experiences that you prefer, that you would like to go through, the seasons of life that you want in your journey. The teacher is saying that life is weeping and laughing. It is mourning and dancing. It is tearing and mending, not or. Grief is part of our everyday experience of being human. Life is not like dim sum. When, when I go for dim sum with my kids, they always just pick their favorites. There's egg tarts. There is the, the fried squid tentacles. And there are those buns that they call lava buns because they're steamed, but when you break them open, there's this wonderfully sweet and salty egg yolk super hot concoction in there. That's what they choose. The teacher is saying that there is a time for everything. He is not offering us some wise and optimistic sentiment. He's not saying, choose wisely. Or if you do these things, you will be able to avoid the tough things that life brings. He's saying that in all of life, these things will happen to us. It's a set menu. But there's some set menus where you know what's coming, right? Like you've been to dine out, 
You know, it's a set menu, and yet even within that, there's some choices. But there's this Japanese style of eating, omakase, where you leave it up to the chef to decide for you. You don't get to pick anything besides sitting down and choosing to trust the chef, choosing them to select the ingredients, to put the courses in the right order. And that's what omakase really means. It's Japanese. It's basically saying, I'm going to leave it up to you. It comes from this root word, which means to entrust. I think the teacher is saying that is what life is like. Everything is going to come at you, but you need to entrust the one who's giving you life. The teacher speaks of life as if it's like a cycle that will always repeat. After birth, there is death. After planting, there is going to be uprooting. After you scatter, you're going to have to gather that back again. One season always follows another. There isn't anything you and I can do to change that. And so while the teacher, in all of his wisdom, allowed him to discern the seasons of life, it didn't free him from experience what is common to all of us. He's subject to these seasons just like everyone else. And and the wisdom of the teacher here is, is not in just figuring out what the seasons are, but in knowing and accepting that he is not in control, as wise as he is as gifted, as talented, as wealthy, as powerful as the teacher is. He could not control it, nor did he try. And this allowed him to face and embrace each season of life as it came. You know, I I bring this up because I think Scripture tells us there is a time for everything in life. And if we only prepare for that which is bright and warm and happy, these sweet parts, then we're going to be woefully unprepared to actually live deeply in seasons of loss and mourning. We are not going to be able to be shaped by these seasons in some profound ways and shaped in such a way that we have something to offer to our fellow human beings and to our world that knows an incredible amount of loss. We are so privileged here in North America. This is how we usually see grief, though, as as those in North America. We usually see grief as seasons of grief. This is usually in response to a great loss in our lives. This is when we lose a loved one, and then for a year or two, we we mourn intensely. But I'm going to be honest with you. If you've ever lost someone that you love, that grief never goes away because that love is still there. We're never supposed to get over these losses, get through these losses. We are shaped by them, especially by our loved ones, because that love is still there, and it should be there. That grief stays with us. And so grief in some ways is not just the season, but in some ways it should be constant with us in some ways, where grief is commonplace, because we all bear loss and pain, disappointments. We all have memories that that haunt us. And in some ways, COVID has caused us to be aware of this. In some ways in North America, we've escaped COVID unscathed for the most part, but there have been losses, there have been changes to your lives, things that you've had to let go. That is grief. It might not be as acute or as intense, but it is still grief. And so there's seasons of grief, there's grief that's commonplace, but grief is a part of our everyday human experience. And yet grief, even if it's commonplace, even if it's a part of our daily reality, we are these wonderfully complex human beings where emotionally we're able to hold joy and grief together. I remember taking Micah to the beach in L.A. after my dad had a stroke. He was still at the hospital at that time, and after he had a stroke, um, my relationship with him became really, really complicated, and, and it was really painful. And as I sat on the soft sand, enveloped by the warm sun, I was just delighting in my two-year-old son, just delighting in him as he, you know, not a care in the world, was just laughing and playing in the surf. 
There was so much joy in that moment, but I've also never felt joy mixed with grief. It was bittersweet. I've never experienced anything like that before up to that point. And as I reflect back, I think I look at that joy, and in fact, it's this joy during that time of grief that became my strength. It became a gift from God to experience yet what was to come. It was a difficult road. Tish Harrison Warren, the Anglican priest, she says it like this. She says, I've come to also see grief as part of the everyday experience of being human in a world that is both good and cruel. You and I, if we're human beings, if we're journeying in life, if we are alive, we are going to experience grief. Grief is a part of our everyday experience of being human. But here's the thing. As human beings, I think we actively resist grief. And here's some ways that we actually resist the call to grieve or to allow ourselves to grieve. The first is that we usually respond to that by just through denial. We tell ourselves just to suck it up, just to, to get on with life instead. We don't make time to grieve. We don't make time to feel. Instead, we busy ourselves because life keeps going. Work beckons. There are people who need us. We tell ourselves to suck it up and, and just get on with it, get on with life. And this is one way we deny ourselves um, the experience of grief. Another is, is through, that, uh, is through the, the, the experience where we don't give ourselves permission to grieve. We, also, we always say, well, someone has it worse than us, and they're allowed to grieve. What I've experienced isn't as traumatic, isn't as intense as, you know, so-and-so. It, it, it fails in comparison, and therefore, we shouldn't grieve. They're allowed to grieve. We're not. In some ways, this is a way of, this is one of the ways that we deny ourselves grief. Another is that we tell ourselves that by not grieving, what we're actually doing is we're developing resilience. We're strong enough. But I'm going to be honest with you. I think the suppression of our feelings isn't resilience. It isn't strength. It, it, it isn't going through the, the difficult journey that, that causes resilience to really form in us. It's simply denial. Another way that we actively resist grief is through numbing our pain. You see, instead of allowing ourselves to sit in the discomfort of our own vulnerability as human beings, in our own pain, we run to things that distract us. And some of these are good things. We run to alcohol. We run to food. That's my go-to. We run to sex. We run to work. We run to social media. We run to movies and entertainment. We would even rather have political debate. We would rather get into arguments on social media um, than face the reality of pain and, and our grief in our lives. And here's the thing, none of these things are bad in and of themselves, but when they get in the way of us facing and embracing our grief, we get stuck emotionally. We get stuck in our immaturity as human beings, and we don't grow. The truth is that it's really hard to slow down. It's hard to sit in the discomfort of our pain. It, it takes time and energy to unpack what's going on inside of us. It's an investment of time and energy and sometimes resources to see a counselor. It's having tough conversations or with a friend. Maybe you need to call them up and, and, and maybe the right person will sit and listen. But unless you and I make space to, to grieve, I, here's what we miss out. I don't think we are able to experience the depths of God's love for us that he is hoping to bring healing out of our pain. He's hoping that the grief can shape us into people who are actually wise, who are able to, out of their own experience of grief, able to comfort others, able to, to live with a resilient source of joy. You see, resilient joy is this character that is formed in the crucible of life. It's through pain. There is no other way to learn it. You can read it. 
You can watch TED Talks on it, but unless you go through it yourself, there's no way that this resilient joy becomes a part of who you are. This is a contagious type of joy. This is a a steady, solid joy. This is the type of joy that is communicated through someone's eyes when they understand the pain that you're going through, and yet when they look at you, you see hope. You know, I think of Bob Jones, and some of you know him. Uh, He was an interim pastor um, at the church that I first pastored at, and he came onto the scene as a whole bunch of conflict was happening at the church, as a lot of my vocational dreams died, as I, as I watched a beloved mentor of mine um, uh, leave, and, and, and as I watched all the things that he endured, uh, that was difficult. And then following that, I, I left, I went to, to LA. Um, my dad had a stroke, and then, so it was, it was this vocational pain, there's this family pain, there's all sorts of things going on. And I remember just meeting with Bob because I needed to be in his presence. I needed something from him that, that I don't think anyone at that time could offer me. I needed to see him face to face, and I needed maybe for him to listen, but just him to be present and reflect the hope that we have in Jesus in the midst of difficulty. And I remember sharing how much I needed that from Bob shared this with a friend, and a friend told me, you know, that that type of joy that that he was able to, to give you in that moment of your pain, that that doesn't come cheap. That only comes through those who've suffered before, those who understand what it's like to be there. I wonder what that's like for us as we grow as followers of Jesus. If we open ourselves up to grief, how would God begin to shape who we are and who we become that we might be this type of blessing to the world? Our world knows suffering. Our world knows grief. They need those who are able to walk alongside. Here's the thing. Grief is stubborn. If we don't make time to deal with grief, if we don't make the space to unpack it, our grief doesn't just disappear. If we don't face grief directly, it always ends up coming out one way or another, usually in ways that aren't immediately recognized as grief, things like uncontrolled anger, or maybe a paralyzing anxiety, or maybe an all-consuming bitterness that kind of, you know, it's us against the world. Or maybe it's an unchecked addiction. You see, our grief, if we don't deal with it, it comes out in different ways. It is still a part of us. It's stubborn. It's powerful. It will speak into our lives. We may try to deny it. It will have its place. And there is this invitation to begin unpacking. For me, um, just three or four years ago, I found myself really on edge. I don't think it had to do with the fact that I had three kids at that time, but I was really on edge. I was starting to lose my temper with those who were closest to me. And I think Kayla at that time, she was one, maybe barely one, super cute at the breakfast table. And I don't remember what she did. It doesn't matter. It's not her fault. But somehow she didn't listen to something that I had suggested or told her to do. And I lost it. I was shouting at her, and I could see in her face she was scared, she was hurt, and praise God for this resilience. She was angry at me for treating her like that because she didn't deserve that. But in that moment, I knew there's something wrong emotionally or maybe even more with who I am. And I remember calling up the counselor and even calling up the receptionist and telling this little bit of why I'm coming, I I want to see a counselor. And she listened and I got counseling from the receptionist over those five minutes because someone listened and empathized. And I remember crying after that. I was like, I need to begin this journey. There's something broken. There's something that I don't understand. I don't know how I got here, but I can't get myself out. I need help. And as a result of that, like I've begun 
to learn how to accept feelings that formerly I labeled as negative and therefore were unacceptable. Feelings like fear or sadness or frustration, anger. And instead of suppressing them, as a, just as a human being, I'm learning how to be more honest with myself. I'm learning how to be more honest with others. And it's really helping me understand that underlying some of this that I'm going through, there has been grief that I've just stuffed for years and years and years. If grief is part of our human experience, and if we actively resist it, the call of Scripture is that we must learn how to weep. We must learn how to grieve. We must learn to face and process our grief. That's an invitation for us. We must learn how to weep because so much of life is actually beauty and pain that is intertwined. I'm going to read uh, Ezra to you guys here, just a couple verses. This is Ezra 3, verses 12 to 13. And it reads like this, and I'm going to explain what's happening. But this is what it reads. Many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could, could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard from far away. The context of these quick two verses is that at the end of the exile, as the foundation of this new temple is finally laid, there is this big celebration that the entire community is gathered to to mark this occasion. And this is seen as evidence of God's favor returning, evidence of God's forgiveness, evidence of restoration. This is a moment that all of the exiles had been waiting for and working for and risked much for. And yet Ezra tells us that this wasn't just simply a triumphant and joyful celebration. Some of the people wept aloud while the others shouted for joy. You see, in this community here, we have people who know how to celebrate and also mourn their losses at the same time. Ezra is telling us that even in this moment of triumphant restoration, this moment of healing, a scar remained. And this scar was worth weeping over. We have much to learn because if we want to go through life, beauty and pain, it's intertwined. We must learn to weep as well because it's better to come to God with all of your doubts and all of your disappointments than just to stay away from God in our grief. The most common type of psalm that we find in the Bible is a psalm of lament, a complaint, a psalm where they are disappointed, where they express sorrow. You see, the psalms, which are the prayer book, the song book of the people of God, they do this genre more than any other type, which has to do with grief and has to do with sorrow. The Psalms teach us how to pray and to relate with God in our pain and in our sorrow. And what I find amazing in these Psalms of lament is how God invites us. He actually encourages us to speak boldly to him in our pain and in our disappointment. To not hold back. Psalm 44 verses 23 to 24. This is just a small picture of what you'll find. It reads like this. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? The psalmist is reminding God of how he cared for them in the past and is asking God in the present why he doesn't seem to show up anymore in their time of need. The, the psalmist is shouting at God, God, where are you? The Psalms of Lament tell us that it is so much better to come to God with our sharp words, with our doubts, with our disappointments. It's good for us to come at him in this way rather than to stay away 
and resent him in our grief. Jesus on the cross prays Psalm 22, and we're going to get there in this journey as we go through Lent and as we look at dying, as we go through um, Good Friday together. He prays from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We must learn to weep because it is better. Scripture encourages us to come at God with our doubts and our disappointments rather than just to stay away from him in our grief. And finally, we must learn to weep because I think maturity as a follower of Jesus involves becoming more emotionally whole, more emotionally alive in him. You see, maturity, according to my Asian culture, tells me that stoicism, the suppression of my emotional life, whether it is pride or joy or, you know, some of these these more positive emotions or the suppression of, of anger and sadness, that that's what it means to be emotionally mature as an Asian man. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that as a man, he is fully alive to his emotions and to his feelings. He is alive to weeping and to laughing, to both pain and to joy. Jen alluded to this verse already. This is John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse, two words and a period. And it simply reads, Jesus wept. And that itself is, is good news. There is so much gospel that we can unpack out of this. It is the shortest verse in the Bible. And what these two words tell us is that while Jesus wept, he still wept, even though he had all the hope. But his hope, all that he knew he would do, all that he knew the Father would accomplish, it still did not diminish his weeping. Jesus, when his friend Lazarus died, he knew he was going to raise him to life again. But he still made time for grief. He truly wept. This tells us that I think Jesus, he takes the evil that we see in our world and the evil done to us in our lives and sometimes that we inflict on ourselves. He takes that seriously. At his friend's tomb, he is not just mourning the death of his friend Lazarus, as Jen was saying, he was looking deep into the darkness of what we would call capital D death, the enemy that death is. He was looking deep into the entire reality of our human suffering as a result of our sin. And he was looking at this humiliating final journey that is common to all of us, that we all must endure in our broken world. And Jesus, when he saw it, he hated it. He hated death. He hated the power of sin and darkness, the power of abuse, the power of violence, the power of genocide, the injustice that happens in our world. And even though in that moment Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead, in that moment that wasn't enough yet to stop the power of the enemy death itself. It would take the cross and the resurrection. But in that moment of grief, Jesus looks into all of our sin, looks into into death and what it's wrought throughout all of history. And according to verse 38, just a few verses later on down, it says that he was deeply moved. The scriptures use this strange Greek phrase for deeply moved. And and it paints a very unflattering picture. It's the phrase you use to describe a, a, a horse that is snorting. And if you and I have ever grieved before, truly grieved, you know that that picture is no different. Because that's when a handkerchief is handy, which it's not part of my culture, right? Like who carries a handkerchief now? No one, right? Well, maybe more now since COVID or something, right? Like, or more sanitizer or something. But grief gets messy. It's undignified. 
We lose our dignity because of how much the loss we encounter actually is. And this is what we see, that Jesus' grief here is not cerebral. It's not spiritual. It is in his entire being. Jesus' grief is no different. It, it unravels him. It overflows. It is powerfully raw. In Jesus, we know that God himself took time to grieve. He is no stranger to heartbreak and sorrow. He did not numb himself or downplay the losses. He did not look so far into the future as to not be alive in the present in the painful, vulnerable moments of life. And I think this is comforting because I know, because I know Jesus won't just come to us in our grief and say that he'll pray for us but he will grieve alongside us. He is fully emotionally alive in both joy and sorrow. This is the Jesus that you and I follow. And finally, I want to end it here. It's this, it's this good news that we grieve and we're invited to grieve because God himself will one day honor our losses. Let me read to you from what we see at the end of Scripture, what we call the new beginnings. This is Revelation 21, 1 to 5. It reads like this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We grieve because God himself will one day honor our losses. I think this is my favorite passage in all of scripture. This is my north star. This is what guides me in the darkest of nights. Because this passage here, it is steeped in hope. Because at the end of the Bible, when Scripture tells, of, tells us of all these new beginnings, John describes this most wonderful moment where God will wipe every tear from his people's eyes. And I think sometimes the temptation when we're reading the end of Revelation is just to get to this passage and to skip the darkness, to get to the light, get to the renewal, get to the celebration of all things that are bright and beautiful again. But that's not what Scripture does. You see, redemption here does not skip over the darkness. Redemption here demands that we let every last tear run. Because in this passage, when we finally see God face to face, when we are finally made whole, when God makes this world new again, there will no longer be death or crying or pain. And all things are going to be set right. But before all of that, there's this moment where we pause. This moment where before all of the good that is going to happen, this all seems to wait until we can have one last long cry. I don't think this image of God wiping away our tears is only a metaphor. It's not just a poetic, beautiful way of saying that when all things happen, when all things are made new, everything is just going to be well again. This is not a description of the neat and tidy. Because if this is not poetic language, what if... One day when we meet our maker, we get one last chance to actually honor all of the losses that this life has brought. What if one day when we stand before God, we will finally hear our life story told 
for the first time in its truest form, where we could understand all the different twists and turns and, and the meaning that we couldn't follow as we were living through it because it was just simply too overwhelming or it's too difficult. And what if our stories, as told before God, included all the darkness of suffering, all the wounds we've received or given to others, all the horror of what sin and death has brought. What if we get to weep one last time with God? What if before we begin to live in the new creation, before all things are made new, we weep one last time with the one who is able to wipe away all the tears from our eyes once and for all? You see, when God makes all things new, this is not a neat and tidy moment. It's going to be messy, and yet it's going to be so beautiful. A couple questions for us, uh, for our life groups, and for our reflection and discussion. First question, how did your family of origin handle emotions like sadness, disappointment, or grief when you were growing up? Second question, what are some ways that you resist grief as an adult today? Third question or set of questions, is there a loss or disappointment that Jesus is inviting you to grieve in his presence? What does learning to grieve look like for you in this step forward? Let me pray. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we learn how to grieve. Shape us as a church to reflect your heart, to have true hope to offer to our world. Help us to be real and to be able to work through our losses, our disappointments, that we may be able to come alongside and listen and offer steady hope, enduring hope, resilient hope to our world. We pray that you'd be with us. We know that there's a few families here um, who've experienced deep loss. Be near them in their grief. We thank you that you are one who grieves with us. We thank you that, Lord Jesus, you are a man of sorrows. You're familiar with suffering. We find you in these places. You meet us there. And that's where we need you. We pray this in your name. Amen.
So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, and all who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come, oh, you're not too far. So lay down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless. Lord Jesus, we just come before you this morning in honesty, and we offer you whatever is in our hearts. God, help us to be real with you, to truly share our aches and our pains and our sorrows and our griefs and our concerns and our fears and our joys, because we know that you hold out your hands and you offer to take all of those emotions and hold them with us. And God, we also offer you our tithes this morning, knowing that they are gifts that you have given us. And God, my prayer this morning is that, that as you take these tithes, and we always pray that you would use these tithes for your kingdom, but but my prayer is that somehow you would tie our financial offerings with our willingness to stand and sit besides the, beside those who are grieving and have no hope. God, that you would intertwine who we are as a community and our church and all the things that we, that we want to offer you and that we would be a hope and a light to those around us in that. Amen. 
This next song is probably going to be new for many people, uh, unless you really love Lauren Daigle, or Lauren Daigle fan, you may know this song. Um, but as, as Phil said, the church isn't great at talking about sorrow and about weeping, and there aren't actually a lot of songs that specifically speak to weeping. And I love the words of this song because it, it speaks to the hope that we have. It says, though times it seems like I'm coming undone and this walk can often feel lonely, no matter what, until this race is won, I will stand my ground where hope can be found. And that we have the hope that God will take all that is wrong and make it right. So as we're honest and as we grieve and in our weeping, may we weep with joy. May we weep with hope this morning, Hope City. Let's remain standing uh, for the Lord's calling and blessing upon our lives this week. Let's bow our heads. Hope City Church, as we journey through Lent towards celebrating life and the resurrection of Jesus, may we learn to grieve and to weep 
to not resist or deny or numb the hurt that we are feeling. Let us face our weakness and our emotions as humans and come to our merciful, gracious, and compassionate God with our doubt and disappointment. Live fully with resilient joy in the beauty and pain of life, knowing that he will honor our losses one day when there will be no more tears or mourning or death because he is victorious. And as you go from here, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you guys, again, if you're able to help out with that family starting at VCS, you can talk to Grace Lovu. Uh, otherwise, have a good week, everyone. Happy spring break. And if we could get your help with the chairs, that would be great. Thank you so much.